Boy office. I could not have asked for a better person to go before me. Because I'm going to talk about something very similar. Uh, first of all, my name is Michael Staub, and some of my collaborators are uh, Joshua Peterson, who is here with me today in, for moral support, and Dr. Borden Mazag and Ethan Gatton. Ethan Gatton is actually the, uh, the PI on this, on this whole project. He is in the psychology department, and so he's our, our big contact for the, the zebrafish. And so we are from Humboldt State University in California. So it's beautiful, nice to be here. But what I'm going to be talking to you today about is about a computational graph theoretical model of uh, the zebrafish sensory motor pathway. And if you say, well, there's a lot of pathways, and that's right, we're going to only talk about one. So, so we, will, we will get there. Um, but before I do talk about that, I want to first talk about this idea of connectomes. And then if, you, if you've been up in the, the, the literature recently, this idea of connectome is getting more and more popular. It's, it was a term coined by Olaf Sporns, who is uh, the graph uh, neuroscientist uh, El Spatial. Right, um, and so let's just let's define this and get over my four accents. And uh, so a neural connectome is a comprehensive map of the neural connections in the brain. Now, we are talking about anatomical structure here, uh, actual actual structure. Uh, these these several different neural uh, connectome projects uh, that we're going to discuss actually is uh, they're using very different uh, comprehensive imaging techniques to visualize the neurons and actually compute its, its connectivity. But the first that, uh, that maybe comes to mind is the, uh, the C. elegans, right? It recently has, well not recently, but it's had its entire neural structure mapped out. All its 302 neurons and thousands of connections, they've all been very detailed, very, very uh, closely examined and looked at. And so, so we are trying to operate in that same spirit. And, not only ourselves, but the human, uh, oh, there's a picture, I forgot about that. Um, the Human Connectome Project, they're trying to do the same thing, but obviously not for uh, silicones, they're trying to do it for the brain. They're trying to map out the, the brain um, and all its connections. We are trying to do it for the zebrafish and for a specific pathway. A question you might want to ask, though, is why? Why, why care about the actual structural connectivity? But, you know, there's a lot of things to infer from that. The, the functional connectivity, the the uh, dependence upon the, the anatomy. So there's a lot of good questions in there to be asked. Uh, so we do want to talk about this pathway. And the pathway we're, we're uh, actually talking about is the posterior lateral line. And uh, let's look at a little diagram here. Uh, so there's three major components to this, to this, uh, this pathway. There's the sensory component, which consists of this green uh, uh, mass here and these red, red dots, which we're going to talk about. There's the brain, which is the processing component, and there is the spine, which is the motor component, right? Three basic components. Let's uh, just move this to the side here and actually talk about these individually. So, like I said, the posterior lateral line, it's composed of uh, small neuromass. These are little hair cells. They detect uh, water movement uh, currents in the water, and they're polarized, and they're a little clump of them. You, you can faintly see in this, this picture there's some very small hair cells there. This image was taken in our in our lab with our confocal microscope. And, uh, so also there's uh, there's these uh, there's these sensory cells which are located in the posterior lateral line ganglia, but they connect to the neuromass receive input, and then they transfer that that, that information to the brain. Uh, they connect to various neurons in the brain, both in the mid and the hind brain, but the largest uh, and most important type of neuron in the brain is the descending neuron. It's also called the reticulospinal neurons. And they de they're called descending neurons because they descend into the spine. And uh, this, this top picture here we can see, these are drawings from uh, Horseradus peroxidase. These are these are old old images, but they, they show very well. Here's the Mothner neuron, which is the largest neuron in the zebrafish brain. But these descend down into the spine. And here we have the the MID two CM, and it's just a particular it's a particular neuron. I believe it's located right around here. But here we see it's descending into the spine in, in several segments. Uh, also in the brain, which I'm sure we we can't get around not talking about 
is uh, brain interneurons. Now, there's a whole bunch of these things, and there, there's, there's so many of them that we, uh, we just can't talk about them all. And their connectivity is, really, is largely unknown. Scientists, um, researchers are not able to really pinpoint their exact uh, dendrite structures and their axon structures. So, so a lot of uh, things dealing with brain interneurons have to be assumed, and, and we'll talk about that in a while. So the next component we move on to the spine, the motor component. There's roughly 25 uh, spinal segments. They, uh, this again is uh, I didn't say, but this is a z uh, a about 120 hour old larval zebrafish. That that's important to know because as they grow, they develop more more cells and, and such. But in the spine, there's also, again, spinal interneurons, just like in the brain. And this here is another image. Uh, these are some small interneurons. This is uh, the segments of this, uh, the, uh, the spine, spinal column right there. And so these, there's, there's several different types of, of interneurons, and they have very different types of uh, connectivity in the spine. But most importantly, there are motor neurons in the spine. They, they extend their axons into the into the muscles and they activate the muscles and, and cause movement, which is which is good. Now, uh, that is the system we're trying to model, and so we want to maybe talk about the, the we're going to have to talk about the model. But I just want to want to ask: Does everyone know about graph theory? I'm sure you guys have all some some common basic level of understanding of graph theory. It's a pretty pretty basic concept here. We have nodes and we have edges, and we're talking about directed graphs, so that we have edges with, with uh, arrows, essentially. But uh, we want to, this right here is a diagram of, of our model, and I would love to show you the actual graph of it, but you know, at such a large size, it's not going to really matter, you won't be able to see any details. So this image, I think, is actually far better. It's, it makes much more sense. And, uh, well, time is perfect. Uh, so we, some, some interesting, uh, model-wide uh, uh, things, talking about some statistics, is, is there's only 2,616 nodes in this, in this whole model. And, and we'll talk about that more in detail. There's a whole bunch of connections, and the number of connections is actually really based upon uh, the connection density that we, were, that we were trying to get. The connection density is assumed to be somewhere between 1% and 5% for, uh, for, the, for the entire brain and, and, and different different neural regions. And so, so at 2.5%, 2.4%, that connection density is what we were shooting for. So if we were to increase the number of nodes, we would have to therefore increase the number of connections to maintain connection density. But, uh, but let's talk about these things independently. And I'm going to skip over a lot of details because there were a lot of details used in creating this, but there's simply not enough time to talk about them. So the sensory component, as we already mentioned, we have neuromass and we have sensory cells. There are roughly 30 of them. Well, in the model, there's exactly 30 of them. Uh, but there's 40 sensory cells. Uh, there are 15 per side and 20 per side. And there's roughly 70 connections to them. And now, uh, as these bullet points here you can read, the neuromass are actually a clump of hair cells, but we're only modeling with a single node because their signals are all sent to the same place. The, the, the sensory neurons that innervate them are the, are the same. Uh, so the sensory neurons also, they only connect to adjacent neuromass. So, so if you have a string of neuromass on each side, which you do, we, can't, we certainly can't connect to the first and the last. Instead, you connect to a band, of, uh, and the, the numbers depend on, on the, on the uh, type of sensory cell, or on, the, uh, on how many connects to you, anywhere between one to, to five different neuromass. Uh, right, so the next component is the brain, arguably the most complex, and unfortunately what I'm going to talk about probably the least because of that complexity. Uh, these neurons, though, are organized in a very special way. They're, they are identifiable neurons. They, they are the same in almost every individual that we see, which is, a, which is a remarkable and not, not the same for ourselves. We have no identified neurons in our brains. So we're able to use these identified neurons to, to create a kind of map of their brain, which we can then use to our benefit. Now, the number of brain interneurons are difficult to actually estimate, as mentioned before, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why we chose to go with 906 of them. And if you wish, we can talk about that later, but leave it to be said is that uh, it makes things nice. It makes things very nice. Uh, but we actually probably should look at this map that I just talked about, and we should be will. This here is uh, 
the map of all the descending neurons in the zebrafish brain. This region up here is the midbrain, and then down here we have the hindbrain. Uh, each of these little boxes represents a cell body, and you can see there's, they've, they've been named and numbered, and, and, uh, and this segmentation is, is the natural segmentation that, the, that you see in the zebrafish brain. It's actually quite beautiful. Uh, so this is what we use, and it's a, it makes it a handy, handy thing to do it. So let's uh, move on and talk about the next component, which is the motor component, the spine. Uh, the motor neurons are the end of the track. This whole system is a feed-forward system. It starts at the neural mass, transgo for, it transfers to the brain, and then it ends in the motor neurons. Uh, but to get there, there's usually some interneurons to go through, and there's several of those in the spine. Uh, as it says here, there's over seven types identified, and they're all accounted for in the model. Their, their specific connectivity, uh, the way they, they, way they branch in the spine is, is, is quite detailed information, and so that has been included as well. Uh, the number of motor neurons is also rather well understood. There's roughly 26 per, per se uh, segment of the spine, so we have a pretty good estimate on that. But the inter number of interneurons is, again, assumed for, for ease and uh, or understanding of the model. So, uh, uh, the one thing I haven't talked about yet is these interconnections that you have seen here, and they're, they're very important. I mean, it wouldn't work without them, obviously. Uh, the total number of connections here is a thousand, and why is there a thousand? Because we were humans, and a thousand was a good number that we wanted to go with. Uh, but, but realistically, there was also, you know, uh, functional reasons that we thought were, were good. We, we made a very large assumption in that the sensory cells connect in a somatotopic fashion. That is, uh, regions of the brain correspond to regions of the body. So uh, you might imagine like your hand has a, a corresponding area of your brain that, that operates your hand. You, you guys are probably in the know. Uh, and the number of connections per sensory neuron were assumed to be the same. So that uh, we didn't treat any sensory neuron as any, any more special than the other. Uh, the connections between the brain and the motor compartment in the spine were very fascinating to deal with. Uh, the axon length of these descending neurons, it, it strongly depends upon their cell type. And there's about 40 different descending neuron cell types that are visible. If you, if you go back to that little picture, you can see they're all grouped in, in various different um, classes, and those classes have very many different axon lengths in the spine. And the arborization along each is assumed to be uniform. The images that we were able to receive, we can, you can actually make out details of their branching into the spine. And since it's hard to determine where a connection existed, we assume that the number of connections were the same, and everything else was done stochastically. And all of these components, I have not been saying it, but many, many, many pieces of this were done stochastically. And so to, to, to actually have a model that, uh, that's going to make sense, we need to take several instantiations of it and then take mean. And so that's exactly what we do. We take a hundred instantiations of these models just to, um, to be able to look at different features and then, then average across them. But this model all by itself, uh, though beautiful uh, right here, this is our, our adjacency matrix. So we have our, our nodes listed from sensory cells to spine, sensory cells to spine, and these black dots represent connections in between them. It's quite beautiful here in this region we have the brain, this here is the spine and its interconnections. This big block here is the brain to spine connections. It's quite beautiful, and every single one of them looks a little bit different. It's, it's very nice, but, but this wasn't good enough all by itself. We needed some comparison models to go along with this. We have, just looking at these pictures and doing tests on them is not enough. We need to have something that, uh, that we have to grapple on. So we made some additional uh, models to, to uh, think about. And the first most interesting one maybe is the random compartmental model. That's a name we made up. Help. Um, but what, what it is, it's the same specifications as our anatomical model, but we removed all the finer details. So this is, this is preserving only the gross anatomical structure. So here again, we have the brain, but instead of having these constrained uh, near-neighbor connections, it's completely randomized. But the connections inside are the same, and the total number of nodes, the same. The number of connections between the brain and the spine, also the same. In every case, we try to preserve the features, uh, but leaving the finer details, like I said, uh, up to chance. And 
And uh, for those of you that are, that are 